Hey, welcome to the John Gardena Classroom. I have a wonderful guest who I've been friends with for just over a year now, and his name's Paul Stutzman. Um, we got connected after I listened to the Three of Seven podcast, and he just told wonderful stories about his, his life's journey and all the books he's written. And I was just enamored of, of all the wonderful things he's done in his life. And I just had to reach out to him because I knew at the end of it that he talked about how he was from Ohio and Amish country. And I just emailed him and out of uh, the kind of person that he is, the respect, he emailed me back. We started talking. Uh, he actually came over to my house the first time, uh, I think back in either end of May of last year or June. And uh, he was over a couple of weeks ago. We had um, dinner just down the street. Yes, we did. And now he's back again to do a little podcast with me to tell his story about the journey of his life, um, the journey of just writing books. And right here, if you're, if you're watching this on YouTube, I just have my new book that came out, Freedom to Ascend. And I, I used um, Paul's editor, Elaine Starner, who's a wonderful lady. And, um, and this is Paul's first book is hiking through. So today, what you're going to hear from, from Paul really is how it all started, you know, where it began, his journey through life, um, all the adventures that he's been on, because we want you to understand this very clearly, that all of us have this unbelievable opportunity to live life to the fullest. And a lot of us don't because we either don't want to take risks or we're just comfortable in our lifestyle and we don't want to rock the boat, but not taking risks equals a lack of experience and a lack of, I would say maybe fulfillment. So Paul is a wonderful individual who will explain kind of where it began and why he's able to accomplish such great things. So Paul, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, John. Thanks for welcoming me up here again today. Well, um, thank you for driving here. I know it's a, not a little bit of a hike, but nothing like yeah. hiking through the Appalachians, right? <laughs> not, not at all. You know what? I was just thinking on the way up, and you just mentioned about living life. And I was just thinking this morning how, how life, so many people exist, they don't live. Mm -hmm. And I remembered back in my restaurant career, I was a manager at Dutch Valley Restaurant, Sugar Creek, 700 seat Amish restaurant, busy. And, um, uh, I met some incredible people there. One of them was an African-American pastor from Cleveland. He was in his 90s. Yeah. And we'd sit there and we'd just talk and exchange stories. And he'd tell me stories about, uh, as a young pastor, he would be meeting with Martin Luther King. Wow. And so the history that he was giving me about that and the things he went through, some racism issues, just incredible stories. And I was telling him some of the things I'd been doing in the middle 50s, mm -hmm. hadn't done that much, I didn't think I did. But one day he came in there and I sat with him and we told stories again. He said, Paul, he said, um, I've uh, nominated you for some kind of an award really? in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I looked at him and said, why? Yeah. Why, why would you do that? I didn't do anything. He looked at me and said, you've lived. Hmm. He said, so many people just go through life existing and you've actually lived. And now I'm actually writing a book right now and uh, it'll be my 14th book. And the title is called, actually called On Living. Hmm. It's about life. It's about living. And um, I kind of borrowed the title from uh, Stephen King, mm -hmm. who wrote a book called On Writing. And anybody interested in writing, that'd be a great book to read. And in this book, On Living, there's going to be On Living, On Spirituality, and On Writing, yeah. and just a bunch of ons. And of course, then On Dying. Mm -hmm. And dying for us Christians is not the end. It's then it's on eternity. Yeah, the beginning. And so that's what the next book is about. But uh, I just and realized, again, coming up this morning, an hour and a half drive, thinking, just contemplating my life, how it's changed so much. And I realized how in the Bible it says, God had plans for us before we were born. You had no idea you're going to be doing a podcast. You no. didn't even think about that. But mm -hmm. God knew that. And God knew my journey, too, which we're going to talk about a little bit more. But uh, it's just an incredible life when we have the courage sometimes to just walk through the unknown where it scares us. There's so much joy after we get through that frightening doorway, yeah. uh, if we have the courage to do it. And I think that's what it is, is um, I, you know, started this podcast 
and I think what happens before you do any journey, like the door where you use Paul's example is you, you feel like you're not worthy or, or you feel like that it's going to be a disaster <laughs> if you do it. It right? might be actually, <laughs> and it might, you're right. It might be, but how do you know if you never try it? Yeah, try it. Right? So I guess today, you know, we want everyone to understand, like you need to right live your, your life and your journey. Cause my one friend who was on earlier a couple months ago, John Michaels talked about it. Really the journey is the destination because if you look at it that way through life, what are you doing? You're always experiencing things, new things, right? Exactly. To share these wonderful, um, whether it's hiking, whether it's biking, uh, whether it's through relationships, all these experiences you have with others. So Paul, why don't you, why don't you start with um, maybe the the awakening moment for you or, or the pivot point where you, you you believe you started living actually this is ironic because you just had your 40th birthday yeah this and, is week yeah uh, so i missed your party i heard it heard about well well you're here that's all that matters <laughs> right, right? So, but uh, some people think 40 is old and and again this is uh kind of tragic but about i don't know if you in the news about a month ago there's a this article in there about a young lady who had uh she was like turning 30 mm-hmm. and it's an african-american lady and she jumped off her high rise and killed herself because she felt her life had just passed her by mm. and uh she's a beautiful girl she had won some uh, contests and she was doing really well in life but she was a, she thought at 30 she's old and i was thinking about that this morning you turned 40 and at age 40 is when my life turned around because mm-hmm. i'm starting to think the first 40 years might be our training ground for God to get us ready for what's yeah. coming next. Yeah. And so remember at age 40, um, I was running restaurants. I was deep in debt and I just was kind of aimless. And I remember one night I had just turned 40 and I literally in my living room floor, I went on the, on the floor and just wept and cried out to God and said, you know what, I've done it my way and I'm tired of it. And now I want to do it your way. And I just gave my life over totally to God, whatever, whatever you've got for me, I'm, a, I'm all willing to do it. Yeah. And at age 40 is when my life changed. And so at age 40, uh, when I committed my life, and that's also when I got in the restaurant business Mm -hmm. and things turned around, I got out of debt. And uh, of course, life was going along pretty well until my wife was diagnosed with cancer. Yeah, let's let's start there, actually, because very similar story. Not that my life before 40 was was bad or anything, but I feel like I have a new chapter of my life uh, as an author and podcaster now. And I do believe, just like you, had that experience that um, that God gave me a vision almost a year ago about influencing people to the kingdom. And I'm just trying to use my gifts and talents on behalf of him, you know, our, my, our creator. So um, I'm going to let Paul talk about what happened to his wife a little bit, um, very you know tragic event in his life, and then what happened afterwards. So go tell a little bit about, you know, she was diagnosed with cancer and um, what happened maybe a little bit during than after she had her passing. Yeah, it was uh, in August of uh, 2002, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And unfortunately it was stage four uh, when it was discovered. And I still remember the day at the hospital after the surgery, uh, the doctor came in the room and shut the door and, and told us the news. And I said, well, how much time? He said, could be two months, could be two years. Yeah. And what a shock, but uh, she lived four years and some days, I mean, some, some of the time was good, but a lot of the time it was just treatment, chemo, losing hair. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I still remember the first night after the surgery, and we were my family and I were on the on the bed, and uh, her first chemo was going through her veins. And I just sat on the bed, opened the Bible, at ran into Psalms ninety one, mm-hmm. and it talks about being the shelter of God. And, mm-hmm. and and at the end of that chapter, it talks about how if we honor God, He will bless us with a long life. And uh, she, she just kind of grasped that scripture and she read it every day for the next four years. It's so crazy you say this because I've been reading Psalm 91 for the past couple of years every morning. Really? I haven't missed it. Okay. And the passage, the specific passage in Psalm 91 is, <laughs> I designed my, my shirt for 40 days of deliverance. It's Psalm 91, 14. Those who love me, I will deliver. Wow. And that is, might've been the exact um, statement in Psalm 91 because it is it's a it's a vow that God makes to us, right? Right. That if you love me, your Father, I will deliver you what from this life for eternity. Right. It's a beautiful it's a beautiful yeah. passage. 
So go ahead, Paul. And the irony of that was uh, I had a uh, scripture. Uh, I was reading the Bible through. Actually, I was, writing, I was reading the Bible through twice a year. Yeah. So it was pretty aggressive uh, reading that I was doing. And when I started this Appalachian Trail hike on March the 31st, my reading that morning was Psalms 91. Really? And so, and it's just how God works and, and shows you you're at the right place at the right time. Yeah. And literally one of those verses in, in, that, in that chapter, now I'm going on the Appalachian Trail for a, which I thought was six months, but I did it four and a half. And I had a backpack with a tent and I'm on a trail with, with rocks and roots. And one of those verses literally says that I will protect you in your tent mm -hmm. and from kicking against rocks. I'm yep. like, oh my goodness, I'm going on that vision <laughs> trail in a tent. And I just read that, that, that chapter. You know, I think, I think when I, everyone needs to know this, like when you're in the will of the father, he will use his word as divine confirmation right. that you're on the right path. Right. And I think a lot of people may have never experienced that. Like you said, maybe you never did before you were 40 or 50. But he's always there, and we want to experience that. But how do you do that? You actually have to get in the Word, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, my pastor told me this, and some people don't believe this, but I'm telling you it's true. Mm -hmm. When Mary passed away, my pastor said, look for signs from God that yeah. are just for me, for you. And uh, for people who are going through loss, and you wonder the whys, uh, there are going to be signs. And in my case, that Psalms 91 was so powerful in that mm -hmm. when I signed up as a through hiker, they keep track of how many people do this hike every year. And in Georgia, I signed in and my trail name was Apostle. We might talk about that a little bit, yeah. but I was hiker number uh, 391. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't think about it. But halfway through at Harvest Ferry, again, that's where the headquarters is and they keep track of us. So I signed in there. I was hiker number 191 which means I passed 200 other hikers as a 58 year old man. That's pretty good. Well, that's real good. But then August the 13th of 2008, when I was at uh, Baxter State Park, that's where Mount Katahdin is. That's where the final hike up the, to the mountaintop is. Again, signed in at a ranger station and I was hiker number 91. Wow. It was just like God was saying, you know what? You, that's... your wife is in heaven. She's fine. Go yeah. finish your hike and go back and write this book. I told you to write. And, uh, which I, I honored that, that request, but I want people to know, especially people who've lost their spouse or loved ones or mm -hmm. whatever, that uh, look for signs from God that things are okay. Yeah, my, when my grandfather passed a couple of years ago, we came home and um, there was a, literally this cardinal sitting in our back door and the same cardinal has been there ever since really every day wow so we feed yeah. him we feed him and his wife now <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. yeah maybe that's an enticing yeah. way to, to come back to the house but you know what yeah. though um that's that's my also when my wife's best friend passed away this cardinal was always there at it always there and i think like we said you know god uses the word or he uses nature and he uses you know in our my case the cardinal right so paul talk about um did you, when you were on your Appalachian Trail hike, did you know you were going to write this book? I had thought about writing a book about a hike. In fact, I had, when I was a restaurant manager, I always knew I'd write one book in my mm -hmm. lifetime. I thought it'd be when I retired. And the book was going to be called About Life. About, or, or it's, no, it's going to be called It's About Living. It's about, about life. Yeah, yeah. And I had a forward at the restaurant. I'd stick some stories in there. But then when I'm on the, on the Appalachian Trail hike, and I had invited God along as my hiking partner and asked him questions. Where were you when Mary died? Is there a reason for this? Is there anything to it? And uh, I started realizing that the Appalachian Trail was a trail that could help me tell stories. Mm -hmm. And so as I did my hike, I would journal different stories. But the, the, the book became different than what, what I had thought it would be. So this is a book about a hike. But it's also a book about healing yeah. and how God brings healing to your life. And so that uh, I always knew I'd write one book. But I never knew. I, I just never imagined that I'd do more than one. Uh, but it's again when when uh, we make a risk. I took a risk. I quit a job at yeah. age fifty eight. Yeah. And because of that, and I did that because God took my wife. Mm -hmm. Now, if Mary hadn't passed away, uh, I would have stayed at work, uh, and would and these thirteen books would have been written. So uh, I took a chance. I took a risk, and uh, God has blessed it in incredible ways. Uh, yeah. the, the the emails I've gotten thousands of emails lives changed people brought back to church and it's just the stories uh, and you'll, you'll encounter that too and that's that's why I, had i kept my job yes i'd have more money 
but I'm sending some awards ahead, rewards in heaven for eternity. We're going to spend a lot more time there than here. We're just camping here. Paul. That's right. Right. We're, we're just camping. And what I want people to have that visual is like, life is so fast here, right? I was just talking to a, a friend this morning about how, like, I don't know, I turned, when you hit 40, some, for some reason, like, you're like, okay, I'm maybe around half part of my life if everything goes well with my health, but there's no guarantee. Yeah. So you kind of hit that, that pivot point of your life and say, what's, what's my mission? Yeah. What, and I know my mission, which is to serve the Lord, imitate him and exhaust my gifts for the kingdom. And your mission was to be an author and write many books to share your life experiences with others. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And it happens so fast. Life happens so fast. You know, you're 40. And remember when I turned 40, I thought, you know what, it's you know, just like you, yeah. I'm halfway there. And uh, now I'm like 31 years beyond 40. I look back, 40 was just yesterday. Yeah. But now it's been 31 years of yesterdays ago that I was 40. And uh, when I turned 70 a year ago, I, I told God, God, I said, I want the next 10 years to be the best years of my life. I want to do that. I want to do whatever you're asking me to do. I want to do it. And uh it's I, and I feel that everything I've done in life, I told somebody this this weekend, is everything I've done in life, everything good or bad has brought me to your table today. Hmm. And that's that's our lives is, is we may screw up and but learn a lesson from it and learn from it and just use it to, to, to forward to go forward in life and to honor what God has for, for your life. And it's always it's so much of the unknown. Yeah, that unknown is so frightful and mm -hmm. people are afraid to do that. But that's where growth happens when you're willing to walk through that door. And, and, and when I made the decision, I literally made the decision one day at my kitchen table. And I've been feeling it. I've been feeling it's time to move on. Mm -hmm. 58 years old. Made no sense to quit a good job. But this is back uh, 2007, fall, fall, winter 7, when I was still reading newspapers. Yeah. Not <laughs> online, but I had to read the newspaper. And I was reading the, an obituary from a, a guy that had passed away in a neighboring county. And he had like two full lines in his obituary of, of what he did, all the different social clubs. And I just wondered if he had time for his family. Did he have time to honor God? Did he have mm -hmm. time to do mission projects? And I just started praying and asking God that I feel it's time to move on in my life. And I just yeah. felt the Holy Spirit saying, would you quit your job if you know I wanted you to? And I thought, yes, I would. Yeah. And that's that day I realized how, there's going to be a day when people are going to read my obituary. Mm -hmm. And I realized I could have an impact on that. I could have a big impact on what that read when they read it. And I thought that day, I want that to be exciting. I want people to read that and say, this guy lived. He lived, but he also lived for God. Well, and that's <laughs> that last sentence is the, the most important. And the last line is, you know, are you living for the world? Or are you living for the kingdom? And when you have a kingdom mindset, it's about God allowing you to enjoy the world and experiences and the journey of life, but sharing his wisdom, sharing his love and, and showing you really the heart of Christ. Because I know you um, hiked, was it with Padre? Padre, right. Okay, so this perfect segue. So talk about your relationship that you built with Padre and you were called... Um, was uh, it, I was apostle. Apostle, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was. I took the name apostle on the trail Appalachian Trail. We have uh, everybody has trail names, and so my trail name I took apostle. Well, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm Paul, so I was the apostle Paul. Makes obviously. sense. Yeah. But the the reason I took apostle was the meaning of the word apostle is the one sense for it with the message. Mm -hmm. And I thought I'm going to have a message for men. Don't take your families and your spouses for granted. Mm -hmm. And so it was. That was why I took apostle. And literally 500 miles up. The Appalachian Trail is a town called Damascus, yeah. Virginia. And so I was headed to Damascus as an apostle and literally had some really enlightening experiences on that hike. But it's part of the hike is uh, if you do a, what I call a through hike, which mm -hmm. means I hiked the 2,179 miles in one stretch. I did, wow. I mean, I, I literally quit my job to do it. People come out there and do what's called a section hike. Mm -hmm. It might take them years to do a section 100 miles every year. Uh, I did the whole thing in one season, which made me a through hiker. So you'll meet some interesting characters out there that are doing that. Typically, if you're going to do a 2,000 plus mile hike, uh, I quit my job to do it. So you're going to meet some interesting characters. And in my hiking book, I talk about uh, different characters that I met. Of course, uh, the Padre was a 
priest of a sabbatical. Yeah. Now I was born Amish, raised Mennonite, mm -hmm. and uh, didn't really know that much about the Catholic world because I had one Catholic uh, family in my community. Uh, and as a Mennonite, we, we just like, Apples and oranges. Yeah, yeah. Totally different. And they need fruits. God. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so no, and of course I as I grew older, I, I realized that uh, that there's there's good people in any yeah. you know, in most the, the mainstream denominations. But so I'm on this trail and uh, I hear about this this priest on the, the trail ahead of me. And uh we have in, in the trail that there could be these shelters. Mm -hmm. and the shelters have these little notebooks and shelter registers, and he would write notes in there. And uh one day I'm in uh, Waynesboro. Uh, in Virginia, we're just getting ready to go into the, in the Shenandoah National Park, and I'm in a laundromat and I'm doing laundry. And I had I knew that Padre had a little flute that he'd play. Really. And so I'm in there and I got all my uh, my clothing in the, in the laundry, and I see mm -hmm. this guy next to me, and he's got his clothes laid on the floor, and uh, there's a flute there. And I said, "Are you Padre?" And he said, "Yes, I am." And that's where I met him in the laundromat, and. Um, that we had a good conversation and from there from there all the way up to maine we'd we'd hike together yeah. and then we wouldn't see each other for some for a few weeks but then toward the end of my hike we're we're uh, together a lot yeah and i was with him in uh, dalton massachusetts on the fourth of july we took a zero a day off mm -hmm. and we're hiking through uh, uh, dalton massachusetts is where the crane paper company is who makes all the paper money in your wallet is made in this town. Mm -hmm. and since it's the fourth of july it was a holiday, so these families are in their front porches. And Padre and I are taking, we're just walking through town. We're chatting, laughing, having a good time. And uh, I I really learned to appreciate Catholic priests because I got some really good stories. Yeah. I mean, just stories about the, the interaction we had about the belief system. And uh, it was that day in Dalton, Massachusetts, hiking through that town, seeing people in their front porches. And I, I told Padre, I said, just look at these people in their front porches. They're laughing, they're having a good time. So it kind of reminds me of what heaven might be like. Mm -hmm. And I said, this is when I got the idea to do a bike ride across America that day. And I said, Padre, when this hike's done, I'm going to ride my bike across America and I'm just going to get stories from people in the front porches. Well, I didn't realize that people aren't on the front porches anymore. They're either in the backyard yeah. or yeah. they're inside playing video mm -hmm. games or watching TV. But uh, so that's where I got the idea to the bike ride, which I did to the bike ride. But I was with Padre one day. We were having a great conversation just about anything like and uh, religion. And um, we're talking uh, about different uh, beliefs. And we're talking about, he was talking about the Paxil mystery. And mm -hmm. I said, I don't understand those Catholic terms. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, well, he said, when I walk through these, uh, and we said, basically it just means the death and resurrected Jesus. Yeah. And he said, when he walks through the deep the valleys, he sees decaying trees. He said, it reminds me of the death of Jesus. And he said, mm -hmm. when I get to the mountaintop, it reminds me of the resurrection. And uh, I asked him mm -hmm. a few questions about his belief that I didn't really understand. He said, well, let's just let's, let's tell you this. He said, I believe that Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood for remission of our sins. Mm -hmm. I said, Padre, we're, we're good. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I said, that's that's the belief I have too. Mm -hmm. And so what I don't understand, we'll just let it be that. But what's interesting has been the interaction that I have had with Catholic people. I had a man from New Hampshire, and he won't mind, he won't mind if I mention his name, mm -hmm. but it's David Gutierrez. And hello, David, when you see this. Uh, yeah. Um, he had left his faith and his family. And uh, he went to, uh, <clears throat> he's from New Hampshire, and uh, went to his, uh, Walmart, and, and, he's, and he loved to hike. Mm -hmm. and, he's, and he saw my hiking book, and he bought it, took it home, and he realized it had spirituality in it. He was just turned off about God and he was going to take it back, but he decided to keep it and read it. And he read it and it brought him back to church. Now, one thing I've noticed in my book, and uh, I've, like I said, I've got thousands of emails. When my book brings people back to church, it typically takes them back to their original, original church. faith. Yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. so he called me one day or emailed me and said, Paul, I read your book and this is what it did to my life, brought me back to church. He said, I started a men's ministry and I had 15 men. And he said, would you come out to New Hampshire and talk to my men? Yeah. I said, of course I will. So I went out, I stayed at his house. And that afternoon, I actually did a, a program at, his, uh, at, their, at their school. And that night at his parish, I did a program. And so back in his house, we talked and we had a great conversation. And uh, some of the conversation is in this book and some of it's in some other books too. But uh, 
he was uh, last uh, fall, he's getting ready to retire. And again, he was at kind of the point in life where he had to make decisions and he came to my house again. And while he was there, he read my Don't Wait Too Long book. I'm mm-hmm. not waiting too Great long. Book. Life. I read that one. Yeah. He now has 100 people in his group and they go to Honduras and they build uh, hospitals for leper colonies. Wow. And I realized how I honored God and left a good job and believed that there's a message there. Yeah. And because, and then now David Gutierrez uh, is a man that has, because of my writing and honoring God, it brought him back to church. And uh, then the don't wait too long again brought him to tears when he realized what he had done to his family mm-hmm. and literally on his way home stopped at a motel and wrote letters of apology to the people he had hurt. Really? And uh, it just, it was just amazing how God has used. I have a high school education. I shouldn't even be writing books. No, that's not true. Yeah. No, but, well, yeah, no, you know, it's like, but no, but God, I tell people God uses the, the foolish to confound the wise. <laughs> and I'm, I'm exhibit A. Oh, uh, you know what? God is he if you look if you look in the Bible though, look at all the characters that um that are in there that yeah. you would never think would be um rise to such, you know, just I I think of David. I always think of David. Yeah, he, my favorite character. My, mine too. And and the reason why, I think probably for both of us is he was the youngest. He didn't have strength, he didn't have this masculine build, and he was just a shepherd boy who was obedient to his father. Yeah. And because of that, you know, he had the seal or I mean, the oil poured over him and he became, you know, the king of Israel. Yeah. Right. He slayed Goliath and, and he this mighty warrior he became. Yeah. Uh, and he he was the greatest king beside Jesus Christ who ever reigned. Right. You know, yeah. and but the crazy part is, is like we don't what the world thinks of strength and might is not how God looks at it. He looks at your heart. And I think that, Paul, you have a a very wise and and loving heart. And because of that, you're honoring God. And I've learned this in my own life now. When you honor God by doing his will, which was to be led by the Holy Spirit to take the trip uh, on the Appalachian Trail and write the book, you've changed hundreds, if not thousands of lives from probably this book alone and all the other ones you've done. And it will for forever because they're always going to be there. So, I mean... I think for, for everyone is just you have to kind of get away from the chaos of the world and be reflective. So maybe you do need to go take a hike or maybe you just need to get take a pause period from from work and find out what's your calling, what's your purpose in life? Because before you know it, like Paul and I said, you're going to you're going to be older and think to yourself, what's my obituary going to say? Exactly. Yeah, right right exactly so i mean paul talk about you know maybe not in, in detail of each thing you've done ever since the hike but the hike was like i call it the trampoline effect where the hike through the appalachian trail led you to uh, biking across america and then i'll let you explain the other journeys you've done okay. since then two years after the uh the hike i did do what i was talking to Padre about there and Dalton, I did the bike ride across America, uh, except that instead of doing a cross country, I did corner to corner, mm-hmm. corner of Washington State to Key West, Florida, and uh, quite an adventure. And the book itself, Bob, uh, Biking Across America, uh, is about the people I met. Mm-hmm. And that's that's the journey in life, is Absolutely. the people we meet. And we can have adventures and hiking, biking, whatever, but it's the people we meet. Mm-hmm. On, and, I'm, and on that bike ride, I met some incredible people. Uh, and uh, we get go into some of the stories but we'd be here for hours yeah and sure. uh, then i got this i remember coming across the mississippi river in cairo illinois and looked down so this mississippi river so these barges and i thought hmm i should kayak this thing yeah. <laughs> so i i was gonna so i bought a kayak and i was gonna kayak all the way 2600 miles from wow. lake atasca where it starts down to new orleans actually it's 100 miles beyond New Orleans where it ends mm. and so i did i did the bought a kayak bought a really good kayak i bought a sea kayak i didn't even know what i was buying mm-hmm. uh but i bought a kevlar kayak and uh it's a great kayak but it was the wrong kayak for the swamps and lake and and uh, mississippi river starts in lake atasca you know in swamps first yeah. time miles of swamps so i had a rudder but i couldn't use it because i was so shallow mm-hmm. and so the first uh nine ten days i was in swamps just Miserable, oh, miserable, oh, yeah. miserable, miserable. And then I got to a lake crossing, a seven mile lake crossing, where I got in a storm and literally thought I was going to die. And, and after I got out of that swamp and realized 
what I had. I had a sea kayak, which is their own kayak for the swamp, but it saved my life on that lake. Wow. And that's that was short circuited by, uh, ironically, my sisters and cousins had been on a bus trip across America, which I had been invited on and said, no, I'm going on a, on yeah. a kayak trip. Yeah. They happened to be coming through the town of Cohasset, Minnesota, where I happened to be. Happened, happened. Happened, yeah. yeah. And so I bailed and came home. And the story, that is my a book called Mississippi Misadventures. And it's a book about that. So it's not, a, it's like 10, 11 days, but it's the most adventure packed 11 days of my life. Uh, and the most miserable too, as yeah. that goes. Um, then uh, I did a hike across Spain on the community Santiago. Yeah. That's a really great hike. I'd recommend that for husband and wives. Well, it's, it's a shorty. It's like 600 miles. Mm -hmm. like that. Let's uh, rough terrain. Though. I've heard about, I've heard other people have done it. The first section is the Pyrenees mountains, mm -hmm. uh, which is probably the toughest. The second part is called the Meseta. It's kind of plains. Yeah. And the third part is Galicia, which is farmland. Um, I found it pretty easy, actually. Well, you, you <laughs> someone who hiked over 2,000 miles yeah. on the Appalachian Trail. But for those who never hiked, I'm sure uh, it could be rough. Well, the thing about that hike is uh, you stay in these little houses called Alberts. You can actually have your luggage taken to the next Alberg, mm. or you can just walk with the day pack. And mm. so, and you can also do like the last 100 miles, you can do that and still get what's called a Compostela, which is your certificate of, of doing that hike. And it's a very spiritual hike. Yeah. At night, I'm in uh, these cathedrals every night uh, with the masses. Not the masses, of course, in in Spanish. Yeah. But I have discovered that I don't care if I understand the language or not. When I'm in these beautiful buildings, see the stained glass, and you can just feel the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And I don't care if you're in any state in America or in any country. When you're somewhere in a in a church. Uh, you don't have to understand the language because mm -hmm. it's the language of, of the Holy yeah, Spirit, the yeah. language of God. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, in a in a place like that, with all these other hikers from all around the world, it's just the the, the beauty of that hike is the people you meet because there's people from all around the world that do that hike. And then the uh, most recent hike I did was in Israel. Mm -hmm. called the, there's a trail there called the Jesus Trail. It goes from Nazareth, uh, goes through Cana mm -hmm. to the Sea of Galilee, and uh, did it. And um, it for those of you who have never hiked Israel or walked, I mean, been in Israel, when you've been there, it's a small, it's a small country. And uh, to be where I was in Nazareth, walked out of Nazareth, walked to Cana, where Jesus did that first miracle. Yeah. And then to Capernaum, where he had his ministry. And you start seeing the history of it and why he would have been in Capernaum because of the trade routes and the distance, which I, I like geography yeah. and maps. And so I realized the distance that Jesus would have had to go from Capernaum back to Nazareth or from Caperna to Cana. And several times a year, he had to go to Jerusalem for the feast. And now I realize when he went from his ministry in Capernaum to Jerusalem, 70 some miles. Really? So it's a two, three day walk. Wow. And there's like three different routes he could have taken. Yeah. And so you read the Bible so different when you've been there, you just feel oh, it. Yeah. So it's an incredible journey that Israel is. I mean, is it, was that your last? That um, was the last one sure. that I've done. I'm, and I've been the last three years, I haven't done that much really. And part of that journey is in my two books, Don't Wait Too Long, mm -hmm. and in The Miracle Journey, which I talk about uh, a loss there that I grieved for three years deeply. And so I didn't do, I, just, I really didn't do a lot of traveling <clears throat> during that time. It was a time of reflection of asking God why. Mm -hmm. why is time of, of broken trust and how do you how do you recover from that yeah. and so i wrote those two books and uh that was a three-year process and uh, i grieve lost pretty deeply i just grieve lost deeply and uh but now this year i have a hike coming up in june uh with the buddy that i went to, to israel with mm -hmm. and there's gonna be there's gonna be four of us through hikers that did the Dafish trail hiking a trail called the centennial trail in South Dakota. Okay. It goes through the Badlands. It goes through Mount Rushmore, actually, oh, nice. Custer State Park. And uh, I think it'd be a fairly easy hike. But then uh, I was in Florida this winter signing books, and a, a young man came up to me and he said, Do you remember me? And I said, I recognize you from my Appalachian Trail hike. I, I stayed at his house. Oh, really? And these boys had hiked the Appalachian Trail, and they asked me a question that uh, he said, Would you ever want to hike the John Muir Trail? Yeah. I said, would I ever? It's probably the most scenic 
hike I've in America. That, yeah. And uh, but I said you can't get a permit. I said you got to get a permit, and they're hard to get. And uh, I said now if you get a permit, by all means I'll go with you. Yeah. But I said I don't think you get one. And uh, forgot about it. And I got an email from him a couple of weeks ago. I said, hey, we've got your permit. And so uh, middle of August for three weeks, I'm going to go with I think it's five other young men, not young men, yeah, but men. And we're going to do the John Muir Trail for uh, the three weeks. So I've got these two hikes scheduled Jeez. this year. Well. You know, you you have put yourself in a position um, of adventure, and when I'm just listening to your story, or stories, is that like everything you did, like from the Appalachian Trail, led you to the bike, you know, yeah. biking across America. Then your bike across America, you're like, oh, I want to do the the canoe trip, uh, or I'm sorry, um, kayak. the kayak on, on the Mississippi. Right. But then what led you, like, oh, I'm done with I'm done with the water. I'm going to go over to Europe and do the Camino and then Israel and then now you're back doing more adventures yes. and but I think I think what Paul what I, what I hear is that you know a lot of people probably won't do all of these adventures you know that you've done right. you know they would think it's astronomical to, to even just do one of them yeah. you know but that's what you were called to do yeah. and I think what people need to understand is you know you don't you may not be called to hike the Appalachian Trail but maybe you're called to do some missionary work or right. You're, right. or maybe you're called to, um, to take a job that where you really never thought you would expect to do. And it's, a, it's not about being in nature per se. It's about the journey of a new adventure to have those relationships that you built while you're, while you're there. Right. Right. Well, it's actually, it's, it's also, it's, it's being open to the Holy spirit. Yeah. And, and there's one thing I realized that uh, a lot of people don't grasp the power of the Holy spirit, what that really is. It's part of the Trinity that's within us. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and if we really are in tune to that Holy spirit, we'll hear. And we might, and I tell people this, God has given everybody talents. Absolutely. Now it may be that your talent is encouraging people. Mm -hmm. And if, when I get encouraging emails, I mean, that, that keeps me going. That encouragement is a gift. Mm -hmm. And you might, I, I, I hear this over and over, and it, I just felt like God was saying, I should call this person, mm -hmm. but it didn't make any sense. Why would I call that person? Yeah. Well, because probably because you've got something that person needs, a thought, an idea, uh, an encouragement, and that's how the Holy Spirit works. And so just because you may think, oh, I'm, not, I'm not a great whatever, yeah. art, artist, athlete, whatever, there is something within you that God put in there that it's your talent. And God has things planned for us, people that we're to meet. And don't miss those opportunities. I really, really well, the third day. Paul, we're we're living proof right here. Like we're we're sharing this message with the world on YouTube and on um, the podcast platforms. Yeah. And if you would have told me a year ago when we just started our dialogue, you know, through emails, right. you'd like that I would have one, my own podcast, two, I'd have my book written, and then three, to be sitting at my table talking about <laughs> our books, I know obviously more of your journey, I would have said there's no way right. in, in a year's span, right? Right. But God works in, in mysterious ways. That, that he does. It's incredible. But you have to listen. And Paul, I, I, know, I, I know how I hear the Holy Spirit, but what's one of the ways that, that you, can, you hear his um, calling or prompting? I hear it when I go walking a lot. Mm -hmm. And that's why on the Appalachian Trail, when I had given up my job, my wife has passed away and my children were grown. I really had nothing anymore except I had God and yeah. Jesus. And I'm walking along and I'm just talking like I'm talking to you. I'm thanking him for this and thanking him for that. Nature to me is very healing. Yeah, I agree. Uh, nature, flower, I love flowers. And uh, it's just when I'm walking out in nature, it's, even when I'm walking, I was talking to somebody this weekend about walking. I think when you're walking, your heart's pumping a little bit faster. Mm -hmm. You're getting more blood to your, your brain. You can think mm -hmm. clearer. And when I when I suffered the law three years ago of a, a relationship, broken trust, I went out to the Appalachian Trail, uh, not to the trail in my town in Millersburg. Every day, I walk every day, and I'd say, God, I need to hear from you today. I have to hear from you. I need to hear from you. And then one morning, uh, the relationship I was in, we actually were going to write a book called Don't Wait Too Long. And... Uh, I got distracted, didn't write it. And it was, it was a mission that God had us on and I failed. And so that one morning, God said, write the book, write, don't wait too long, write the book. Yeah. And I've written that book and there's stories in there. There's some mornings I get up, I'd have a devotions 
and and the Holy Spirit said, "Today you're going to write this story." And I remember one morning it was a story about the lady with the uh, alabaster jar that she broke over Jesus getting yeah. ready for burial, mm -hmm. and 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 God revealed that you're going to write that story today. And I was when I went to prayer, I just wept. And uh, that story has been so powerful. It was written under the Holy Spirit. But uh, people, people, I remember this is early on after the hiking book came out. I got a call literally from a guy in the middle 70s. He was a Mennonite man. And he said, I read your book. And uh, he said, you talk about hearing from the Holy Spirit. He said, I'm 75 years old. I'm the same religion you are, Mennonite. He said, I don't think I've ever heard from the Holy Spirit. And uh, I said, well, do you read your Bible? Yes. I said, do you pray? Yes. I said, then if you're reading your Bible and your mind's open, you will hear. Yeah. You just will. Yeah. And so, and so many people, I, I maybe, maybe they expect what this wonderful, overwhelming thing, <laughs> and it can happen because it's happened to me. And it's, I'm sure it has to you too. It has. But it may just be this little subtle idea, thought mm -hmm. that you should do this, you should call somebody. That you think, well, that's that doesn't make any sense. But the more you do that, and the more you avail yourself of that, the more you're going to hear too. I, Paul, I think for everybody, I mean, for me, very similar to you, is when your heart's moving. Um, for me, because I'm a I'm a runner. Okay, so when I'm out in the morning every day, I just have the sense of clarity, and you you have more of a grateful heart when you sweat for some reason. I don't know. I, I, it sounds crazy, but when you when you sweat and you actually, I don't know, if just the way God designed us as movers, that you you almost have this this clear, conscious, clear spirit to where the Holy Spirit can work with you more than just being sitting down. Right. And I'm not saying I'm not saying you can't hear the Holy Spirit that way, but I have found it sounds very similar, Paul, that we both hear from the Holy Spirit more when we're moving right and in nature yeah so to everyone out, out there like our advice would be move yeah move <laughs> you <laughs> if you want to have the movement right. of the holy spirit upon you you got to move your body a little yeah, that's bit. that good statement there yes yeah so well talk about let's um i want to get towards towards the end here a little bit that you know what is your you said earlier about your mission your last 10 years that you want it to be the most, uh, I think, I can't remember the word, it was growth or most joy or, uh, what was that? Well, I, I figure from, in 10 years from now, I'll be, man, yeah, I'm almost afraid to say it, 80? Wow, that sounds old. You're not old, Paul. No, I'm not. I know I'm not. I, I, you don't I look old. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm moving too fast to be old, but uh, I have lived that many years, but uh, I told people there's a young 70 and old 70, I signed up for young. Yeah. It does not promise this anything mm -hmm. but uh, again if we if we eat right exercise and we're good but we should in, in you know get our lot of years yeah but uh i have a few books i want to read uh, right yet because yeah. i know i have some ideas and thoughts that i know will will change lives and to me that's the the, the thing about the book and you'll find this you when you get emails and letters from that somebody writes and said i read what the words that you wrote it changed my life yeah that is the reward yeah, and, and that's what I want to do. I've got a few more uh, thoughts and ideas I want to get out. Uh, I've actually another uh, partner and I have started a, a business called Amish Gardens, mm -hmm. and we're making room sprays and medicines and salves and things like that. And so I still I still have that business mind too that I want to create something. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know, and you probably feel the same way because you're a runner, you're aggressive, and it's always like. I got to do more. I got to do more. I got to do more. And uh, it's like, when is it? When is it enough? When do you just do nothing? Well, I can't not do anything. <laughs> you got to do something. Paul, that it, it, or like what he's saying is exactly how I feel. And um, my wife even even said she put a post out on, on Instagram or Facebook, and she's like, you know, my husband has done more in three months than some people have done in their lifetime. It's true. But but I again it's not me. Like I'm taking action, which right. you know when once you're commissioned by the Holy Spirit to do something, you're commissioned to do something. I always tell people it's disrespectful to the Holy Spirit and to God right. to not do anything. Yeah. So like if you have these talents, which is even with a high school education, all right, to write and to tell your story and about your journeys, like that's what you're called to do. So 
and I feel the same way. Like I'm, I feel like I have a story to tell. And in my first book is, is literally about how you can improve your life when you're on mission from God. Right. right? And, and there's strategies that I have learned in my 40 years that have made me, I don't really like the word successful, but let's say um, impactful right. to others because we as Americans have become more comfortable and that's an issue, right? We, we're not producing anything. Our fruits are bare, right? right? So I think what Paul and I were trying to say is like, you all, all of you have gifts and talents. Why aren't you using them? And why do you think most people don't use them? Because they don't know what they are. I would agree with that. They just don't know what they are. And sometimes it's a, just ask somebody, you know, just ask them, what do, what do you see in me that could help other people? Uh, or pray about it. And, and the fact that, it, that they question it is a good, is a good thing. It is. Yeah. And I think what I've been doing this year is with my students, um, it's called 16 personalities test. And what it does is it goes through a bank of questions and rankings and it only takes 10 minutes. Right. And it gives you a four letter code and it, out of these 16 different personalities, it gives you one that pretty much matches your, who you are. Right you know, based on your, what you like to do, what you're interested in. So like I would tell people, and I'll put it in the show notes um, on this podcast is go through that 10 minute test and, and just reflect on what you read. It may not be perfect, but it's going to tell you what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are. And then what do you do from there is on you. Like, but I would say this, um, what, what Paul has stated throughout this whole conversation is if you don't act, expect nothing. Right. And I mean that like, the experience, the, the, the views, the relationships. But if you would literally, and this happened to me, Paul, in my small story, in my little journey of life, is I went out for a, a 20 uh, mile run uh, a little over a year, about a year and a half ago. And I saw these three runners up at, up at the crack of dawn like me with their head torches on, Kevin Rose, right? the head torch. <laughs> and I just, I passed them on this big hill and about half an hour later, I saw him again, and I was prompted to ask, just, can I run with you? And they've been my running group ever since, wow. every Saturday. Because of a choice you made, a slow decision you made. One, yeah. one simple right. question. Right. Can I run with you? Right. Yeah. One thing, too, and you're, a, you're a school teacher. Yes, sir. Now, what we do a lot of times, too, is, uh, and if for people who are questioning their talents, you may actually be using your talents not knowing it. A school teacher plants seeds. Yeah. I remember I had a teacher in school and um, he was only there for, I think, two years. I had him one year in, in my literature class and uh, he left and I think went to the Peace Corps. Mm -hmm. This time going back to the late 60s. And um, after I uh, got out of high school and, well, actually, then later became an, an author and was writing books, I wanted to dedicate one of my books to my school teachers who had. I mean, I'm in their classes and a lot of times I'm bored. My mind's actually outside, my body's inside, but they are planting seeds, they're planting mm -hmm. seeds. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to dedicate one of my books to my teachers. And so um, I, I did do that, but I didn't know, some of them had passed away and I wanted to recognize that. And so I checked this one teacher out and, and I saw he had passed away. Yeah. And uh, later I got an email from this guy and he said, I was at church and one guy said, I, I mentioned, you, you mentioned me in your, your book. And I said, you've got to be kidding. They have internet in heaven. I said, <laughs> yeah. I said, I thought you died. And he said, literally, he said it was a relative of his the same name. Oh, really? And uh, he said, I want to meet you. And uh, I met him at a restaurant and, uh, and he just, we were talking and I said, uh, uh, I want you to know that sitting in your literature class, I said, I can still remember sitting in the back of the class you're describing a story that Jack London had, the, the, the author, about a, a man that was in the, out in, in Alaska, I believe it was, in the winter. And uh, he was freezing to death. Yeah. And he built a, had a, little, had a little pile of sticks there. And, and he was up there describing how he was lighting these matches, trying to get this fire going. Mm -hmm. and, and as a student, I'm listening to his story. I didn't ever know who Jack London was, but and I, I now do. And uh, finally, he got down to one match, and he lit that match, and the fire stuck. His flame burst, and it's wow. like all is well. Well, all of a sudden, 
a big clump of snow dropped down and extinguished the fire. Really? And the man died. Um, or assume he died. Yeah, yeah. It. But I read uh, literature in high school because I had to. Mm -hmm. After I got out of high school, I was raised with no reading, no TV. So and when I discovered the library, to me, that was the gold mine. Yeah. And so, but I, so I read all kinds of books. But after high school, I started reading literature books because I wanted to, yeah. based on what, what his teaching had given me the interest in, in classic literature. And I, I was, uh, Henry David Thoreau is my favorite author, Life in the Woods. It's, it's so deep that it's like, I tell people, it's like the dog that chases cars and finally caught one, didn't know what to do with it. Yeah. That writing is so deep sometimes, you just, this, but it's incredible writing. So I, was, so I met with this ex-literature teacher and I told him this, I said, because of what you were teaching me, I now read all these literature books and I now write books. That man sat there with tears in his eyes. He said, I never knew I made a difference. You know what, as a teacher, so I can, I can speak up, upon this, you really only hear, oh, just maybe a couple of stories. You know, I can maybe count on both my hands where I feel like I really made an impact. And again, it's not about being self-righteous. No. It's about delivering to an individual of hope. Right. And exactly. planting those seeds of hope. And right. because we know as teachers and mentors that you see something good that they do well, right. that they don't see yet. So like our, our mission, our objective should be not only teach the content that we enjoy teaching, but also building up these students to be great, great parents one day, business owners, maybe authors. Right. And they never thought of in a million years yeah. that they would do it. And that's the beauty of life is that we should all be building each other up, whether you're a teacher or not, you know, as a parent, or um, an uncle, or wh whatever it is. So, you know, Paul, uh, I man, we could sit here all day, and I I, I love these conversations. Um, so, one thing that I want you to tell the listeners before of how they can reach you and how they can reach you and read your books is, what's the big message? Since you lived such a, a fascinating life uh, of, your, of your seventy some years, and like that obituary message that you talked about earlier is what would be, I'll, I'll paint a picture for you. You get to heaven. What does God say to you that you wish you want to hear? Maybe I'll put it that way. Yeah, actually, if, if you want that actual conversation, it's actually written and don't wait too long. Well, when I, when I write about approaching heaven, what I want God, what Jesus is saying, mm -hmm. and I want him to say, you're here because you didn't wait too long. You made the decision to honor me. You made the decision to follow me. You made the decision to give your life to, to Jesus. Um, one other thing, and there again, you ask about how to get and reach me. If they go to hikingthrough.com or my name, paulstisman.com, mm -hmm. my books are all there. But I wrote uh, the most recent book. Well, actually, the most recent book I wrote was, was a children's Children, book. Which I have. You awesome. have that, you have yeah, that children's Cloud book. Factory. Yeah, Beautiful. Cloud Factory. And yeah. it's actually the second one that works there. But the one before that was released a year ago. It was called uh, The Miracle Journey. Mm -hmm. And it's the journey of recovery from loss. And in, in my life, I, I had a young friend. I was 15. He was 14. And he died in a bike wreck. He was right beside me. Wow. And so, and then, of course, my wife passed away of cancer. I uh, lost both of my parents in within a week. Wow. And then I've lost a brother-in-law, lost a sister-in-law. And uh, so I've had a lot of loss. And so the miracle journey is a journey from loss to hope. And mm -hmm. you just mentioned on that. Mm -hmm. That book, The Miracle Journey, is about hope. I don't care what you're going through, whether it's the loss of a spouse, a child, a job, divorce, whatever. Yeah. There is hope. But there's a journey involved. Mm -hmm. And I write the book, The Miracle Journey, based on the children of Israel. They were in Egypt, mm -hmm. but they belonged in Canaan. Mm -hmm. And to get there, they had to go through wilderness. Now, they could have done it in 11 days, but for some reason, God knew that that 11 days probably wouldn't have worked right. So it took them through a, a 40, 40 years. Then it would appear again. They were, they were at the border and spent 38 years wandering about there. But during that time, they spent a lot of time looking back. Mm -hmm. And we do that when we go through loss. We, our spouse passes away. We look back with regrets, uh, which is normal. But our hope is not in the past. It's in the future. Just like the children of Israel, their hope was in Canaan, mm -hmm. but they had to go through this wilderness. And that's the journey called grief. Yeah. But my my message is there is hope. 
just keep going don't stop just keep going through that journey feel it feel it live it too many people don't want especially men uh, they don't want to grieve it's painful mm -hmm. we're problem solvers so our spouse passes away pain is intense how do we solve our pain while well, we get married again and do it too quickly yeah and so it's and that couldn't be any any of us could be a divorce and getting married too quickly it could be losing a job and it, it, anything mm -hmm. it's you got to feel the pain you got to go with the journey and uh once you get through that and you've grieved it then you're ready for the, the for the, the new life but just know when you're in the middle of it and you feel like tomorrow today and tomorrow is just not worth it it is because there is hope one more day one more day we they were always told on the Appalachian Trail people ask me did you ever want to quit and I said yeah every night I want to quit every day <laughs> sure. but sure. we're, we're told is if you really plan to quit when you're doing a through hike like that at least go one more day and yeah. that's the same when you're journeying through your grieving you know don't give up because there is hope and your hope is in Canaan and that's where you're heading and I wrote the I wrote the miracle journey as I invite some Old Testament prophets along on our journey. Mm -hmm. And as we go on this journey, we put down signposts for people that are following us. They just follow these signposts. They'll be able to take you to Canaan. And that's what the miracle journey is about. And wow. people have suffered loss and they read that and realize this, this guy's been through it. He understands loss. And uh, so that, that book is a pretty powerful book for people who suffered loss. Yeah. I mean, I, I think my personal experience and you have way more wisdom um, in your life but i think if everyone would understand that you're gonna struggle and i look at it you know as, as christian men is that i don't look at it as a negative i actually look at it as a embracement period because there's no one who suffered more than jesus christ right right so when i suffer I try to put myself not in Christ's shoes, but to be there on that journey to the to Calvary and say, you know what, you you did this, right? right. To save us for to get to Canaan, to get to heaven, right? right? So whenever you have that that suffering period, my best advice would be just put it on Christ. Be be with him on that on that journey. Because when you do that, the Holy Spirit comes in. This is what I, I, I have felt strength from the struggle, yeah. whether physical or emotional. And once I align it with Jesus, Jesus is suffering, something happens where this burden kind of comes off and it, it allows me to um, feel fulfilled that, you know what? I have, I have that resurrection moment, right? right. Of hope that I'm going to get out of the storm. And after it, and this, I witnessed this myself on my front porch, there'll be a nasty storm come through. And then all of a sudden the, the sun will peek through and you look outside and you see what a rainbow. Right. And that was God's sign of a covenant he made with Noah yeah. to say, you're my chosen people. Yeah. I love you. So I think for everyone, you know, just with Paul being here, such wisdom, um, from everything he's done, you know, not just the hiking, but how to live life. Um, one, I like that one signpost at a time to get to the destination. But again, to have the destination of eternal, um, just being eternal paradise, you got to enjoy the journey. But we know you're going to embrace suffering through that, but live one day at a time. So what a great message Paul gave to us today. Anything else, Paul? Well, I would tell people, uh, on the Appalachian Trail, there's a sign on top of Mount Katab that, that, that said it's the end of the trail. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was so easy sometimes to get up there. I just want to get that sign. I just mm -hmm. want to get there. And in life, so often we have these destinations in mind. And mm -hmm. that's so focused on that we miss the day-to-day -day journey. The, the joy is in the journey. The joy is in the day-to-day -day journey. And because, because when, I, when I hit that sign on uh, Mount Katab, I realized I had no job to go back to. Yeah, and my wife is gone, and I thought, "This is it. It's over." Yeah, and but then, of course, I realized I needed to write a book too. But uh, there's also these things in life when we get these storms in life, it causes our roots to go deeper. Either mm -hmm. it'll either be deeper or we're going to be shallow. Yeah. I hiked through um, the Smoky Mountains, and a storm had come through there, and literally uprooted these trees. Huge root systems uprooted, 
I was in, uh, I had just left West Virginia. I was in Maryland when a storm hit me and I wrote about the storm in here. And it's a horrible storm. The tornado came through, ripped out hundreds of trees. And out in, a, in an open field was an oak tree. And I literally went out there and grabbed that tree and held on to it for dear life. Its roots were deep enough to hold me yeah. because it weathered storms. And so when the storm comes, it gets your roots deep in Jesus and you'll weather any storm that comes along. And uh, it's just, you see it in life, how many people, a storm comes along and they just they don't know what to do. And it's just like they, they give up. No, weather it, you get stronger. Your roots are going to go deeper and you'll be able to weather these storms. And I think that's, um, that's so true, Paul. Because people, I have, I mean, I witness every day. People don't know what to do. Their their emotional states are very unstable because they haven't found peace and joy in Christ. So once you once you know that, and you know that you're going to be taken care of, you'll be delivered because you love Him. Go back to Psalm ninety one. You're going to be protected by His love. He wants to protect you and love you throughout the journey of life. But the question is, are you? allowing him to come into your life yeah. in your heart. Now, we both talked about Psalms 91, and I want people to know, whatever you're going through in life, there are verses in the Bible that will absolutely help you. When mm -hmm. I was going through my pain of the loss of the relationship, I, I literally, on my phone, I've got dozens of scripture verses mm -hmm. that I read about hope. And I go back to David. I love David. Oh, you know, he would, he would, there's someone chapter in there. He's lamenting and he's cursing his enemies. And may they be this, may they be that. I'm this, I'm lost, I'm hopeless. But yet I will praise you. Yes. It's like, yeah. thinking, that's me. Yeah. So, well, Paul, thank you for um, coming on today. God, I enjoyed it. It was, uh, it's always a pleasure to, to be in your presence. Um, talk about the journey of life. Talk about the importance of Christ in all of our lives. Yeah. And uh, just, you know, for everyone, please just take action move your body, listen to the Holy Spirit. And once you do that, your life, the trajectory of your life changes. So everyone be good, be blessed. Uh, we both love you. And this class is dismissed. <laughs>